Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Tara, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tara. And I want to thank Cameron for asking me to come out and share tonight, and Lee for calling me today to remind me, um, Terry and Lee, and some friends that met for dinner before the meeting. I'm so grateful to be here. Um, my sobriety date is April 18th of 1994. My home group is the Big Book Group in Bellflower, and I have a sponsor. Her name's Tina. And uh, it's great to be here with you guys. I think I spoke during the pandemic, so it's nice to be here in person and to see your faces. And... You know, I was thinking about it on the drive up. I live in Dana Point, so I had a lot of time to think (laughs) on the drive up. But um, I was thinking about just, Paul and Terry Marie have been good friends of my husband and I for a very long time. And I was thinking about how grateful I am to have friends in sobriety where we kind of walk through the same things together. You know, they have a daughter who's the same age as our daughter, and then our sons are the same age. And that's been a a really special thing to to share with them through these years. And we have another set of friends, um, Bill and Rebecca, who have the same thing. And I just, you know, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love everything about it, and I'm just really grateful to be here. Uh, My job is to share in a general way about what it was like for me, what happened, and what I'm like now. And if there's anyone new or newer tonight, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I hope that you stay and that you find what I found here. And I'll share what that is in a little bit. But, um... You know what it was like for me is I grew up in Southern California. I was raised in a nice home. My parents were married for 42 years. Um, My mom was a stay-at-home mom most of my childhood. My father was an engineer. My mom and dad took us to church. We were raised Catholic on Sundays. Um, We were involved in, like, the kids' choir and the youth ministry, the homeless ministry, the battered women's ministry. I mean, we were just taught to be of service from as far back as I can remember. My mom was just a person that knew how to handle life, you know, without a sponsor telling her what to do. And my dad was one of these self-made guys. He was raised by a single mom. His mom died of, or his father died of alcoholism when he was 13. And, And my grandmother worked in the packing house, packing oranges. My dad joined the Navy, and then he went to school to become an engineer. So I was raised by really nice people, and if their love and fine example for living would have prevented me from becoming an alcoholic, I wouldn't be here today, you know, um, but the message I always got from them is you grow up, you go to school, get good grades, go to college, and do something good with your life. That was their expectation of me, and I thought it was fine. I mean, that was what I wanted to do, and you know, ever since I can, as far back as I can remember, I was the kid that was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable, anxious, nervous, afraid. I was a nail biter. Um, But on the outside, everything looked good. You know, I'm one of those people even today that can come in here and I can smile and act like everything's great and I could be drunk on my way home. You know, I'm that, I'm that girl who can put a smile on her face. And um, so no one knew that I was uncomfortable. You know, I, I remember being a little girl and I would grab big chunks of my hair and yank it out and braid it and wear it like a bracelet, you know, gross. And uh, I, 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 like, erase my skin with an eraser, aerosol can to give myself a burn. And I invited all these girls to our condo in Palm Springs for spring break in the fourth grade. And we didn't even have a condo in Palm Springs, you know. But, like, I wanted to be the girl that could have the condo and invite all her friends. You know, I was a liar before I was a drinker. And... Um, My best friend came to school around that time, you know, fourth or fifth grade, and she had a cast on her leg because she broke her leg, and I got jealous because everyone was giving her attention, and I went home that night and started hammering my ankle so I could break my ankle and get a cast and get attention too. You know, that's not a normal reaction to jealousy, but that is me. That's who you're dealing with without any tools before I even took a drink. You know, I was very uncomfortable and abnormal, (laughs) you know, and... um, and so, you know, I was, I was normal, I mean, in some ways, doing all those things that girls do, you know, Girl Scouts, sports, um, good grades, you know, active in church, all those things, and I, um, I'm a good starter, you know, went on to middle school, I was on honor roll, ASB track team, cheerleader, all those things that good girls do, and I met this boy, and he was the class clown, you know, the kid that was always in the principal's office, and I love those bad boys, you know, I do, and and he invited me to meet him at a donut store before school one morning, and I met him there, and it was him and three boys, and they had a maroon backpack full of liquor, and I took my first drink, we walked behind that donut store and sat by a dumpster, and I took my first drink, and it was 80-proof peppermint schnapps, 
and I loved it. I love the effect produced by alcohol. You know, I, um, I never, you know, I took that drink because I wanted those boys to like me and I wanted to fit in. I can remember as far back as a little girl, both of my grandfathers died of alcoholism, like really alcoholism. And uh, my parents, there wasn't a lot of liquor in the house, you know, and they would just say, don't try drinking because you won't know what you're missing, you know, because they knew what it was like to be around alcoholics. But I took that drink that day and and I just loved it. You know, I loved everything about it. I don't remember feeling prettier than or better than or anything like that, but it quieted that madness in me. You know, it quieted it. It made it feel like it was going to be okay. And I started drinking every opportunity I could. I was young. I was like 12. I couldn't drink every day, but I um, would meet these boys before school sometimes or we'd, you know, um, on minimum days, we'd tell our parents we were walking a sizzler and go to someone's house whose parents were working and drink. And then I started dating high school boys and sneaking out of the house and going to the high school keg parties. And I love it. I love booze. You know, I love being by that keg. I love beer bonging. I love playing drinking games so I can try and drink you under the table. You know, I love, I had this friend, her name was Sarah. We were Tara and Sarah and we'd just pound beer and then we'd try and burp the ABCs and who could see who could last the longest. You know, I mean, I'm a party girl. Like put me on my, on a handstand and give me some booze and I love it. And, um, you know, within a per short period of time, I was no longer on honor roll, you know, I was no longer an ASB, and my grades were not good. And in my household, that was not acceptable, so my parents decided to send me to an all-girls Catholic high school because they thought it would fix me. And in retrospect, you know what, I thought it would fix me. I remember that was the first time I thought, I'm going to stop hanging out with these boys, I'm going to stop partying, I'm going to go to that school, I'm going to get good grades, I'm going to go to college and do something good with my life. And I went there, and the tradition there is... Your first week, a freshman's paired up with a senior. She's your big sister, you know, and eats lunch with you and introduces you to people. And I got paired up with a girl that was just like me. You know, she loved the Grateful Dead and Janis Joplin and Led Zeppelin and the Doors. And we would meet at Acacia Park in Fullerton before school. And I'd, like, roll up my Catholic schoolgirl uniform and unbutton that shirt and tie it off. And we'd split, you know, 40 ounce of beer and go to school and sneak off campus and smoke some pot and... Uh, you know, I'm in high school, so I'm going to those high school keg parties. I acquired my own tap so I could get into the parties for free, you know, and, and I just loved it. And what happened for me is I got tired of living by my parents' rules. You know, they were, they were good people, and they maybe gave me like an 11 o'clock curfew. I don't know what it was. But, you know, I'd be at a party with um, boys, you know, boys that I had met at a party before, and I wasn't with anyone I'd left home with. And I think, okay, I have an hour before curfew. I'm going to have one more drink and then get a ride home. And you know what? That's not the way I drink. It's not, probably not the way you drink either, you know? And then 30 minutes before curfew, I think, okay, one more drink, and then I'll get a ride home. And then it'd be like two hours after curfew, and I'd think, ah, oh, I'll just go home tomorrow, you know, and keep partying all night long. Because I'm an alcoholic. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. I'm self-seeking. I didn't care that my mom was wondering where her, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old daughter is calling the girls I'd left home with and finding out I'd gone to some party with other people they didn't know, you know, and, and I would just show up the next day, you know, with an attitude, and they'd put me on restriction, and I got tired of it, so I started to run away from home. And at first it was okay, you know, at first my friends would sneak into their house when their parents went to bed, but I'm the kind of girl that, you know, I do scandalous things, you know, I have to drink, and if you're going to get in my way, you know, I, I burn through those friends very quickly. And, um, you know, I found myself, I met this guy, and he was a um, drug dealer, and he, um, his dad was a real estate broker. And they, he had this list, somehow he could figure out on his dad's list of homes that were for sale in our area that people weren't living in. And so we'd break into those homes at night to have a place to sleep, and um, in the morning he'd say, we got to go do Tara's beer run. And we'd go to different grocery stores in Orange County, and, you know, I was... I look like a normal teenager. You know, I had this little canvas green piece tote bag, and I'd walk in and steal my bottle of Jägermeister, my bottle of tequila, and I'd sit around, and I'd just watch these boys skateboard or do whatever they were doing all day long. And at night, we'd drive around nice neighborhoods to look for garages that were open so we could get into people's homes through their garage doors or steal stuff from their garages to pawn off at pawn shops for more booze and more drugs for them. And, you know, I, I didn't know people lived like that, but I very quickly didn't care. You know, I very quickly became the person that became willing to do anything and everything for another drink, you know. And, and one night, after hanging out with them for a while, I had been a runaway for about six months, and I grew up in Anaheim Hills, which is a nice little suburban area. 
and I got caught urinating in public in a Taco Bell drive-thru, you know, and they don't like that in the suburbs, as you guys know. And I got in the car, and the police lights came on, and I was so drunk I gave the police officer my real name, and he took me to my first stint. I went to an adolescent um, rehab. It was called CPC Brea, and that was the first time I was exposed to AA. I, you know, I, what I heard people, the panels came in, and I heard the women sharing that they lose, lost their kids, their homes, and their cars, and I could not identify with that, and I immediately slammed the door shut on AA. I thought, I'm not like you. You know, and my dad came to pick me up on Christmas Day to take me home for an eight-hour pass, and we got close to where we lived, and my dad pulled over, and he started, he said he was sorry, and he started to cry and told me he was sorry I was an alcoholic because he worked so much. And the kind of person I am is I accepted his apology and let him believe it was his fault. You know, we went home, and he stood at the top of our stairs, and all our family was there for Christmas, and he explained to them where I was and how it was his fault. And while I was in that first detox um, psych ward, my mom had figured out a plan with the principal of our school and the priest of our parish for me to graduate with my class. And, you know, I would have to take a few extra classes in the summer, and she told me that I could do that, and I thought, okay. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to stop partying. I'm going to go back to that school, take these extra classes, graduate with my class, and go to college and do something good with my life. You know, and I got out of there, and, you know, the obsession was so strong. I, I, you know, I just felt like I was going crazy. And I remember being at the grocery store, I don't know, within the first week out of that that, um, psych ward, and I saw some people I could drink with, and I was gone again. And, you know, for the next three years... um, I guess about three years, I would be in and out of my parents' lives. You know, I would show up on their doorstep, just tore up from the floor up. You know, and at first they'd let me in and give me some food and let me shower, and I'd make all these promises. Yeah, I'm going to be here when you get home from work. Yeah, I'm going to you know, go back to school. I'm going to get my GED, and then I'd be gone again. You know, and, and, uh, and I just, I was not a good daughter. You know, and I know what it's like to be ruled by king alcohol. I had to drink. That became the priority. And, you know, I no longer had those guys didn't want anything to do with me. My girlfriends didn't want anything to do with me. Girls that I had grown up with, you know, gone to preschool with. And, um, and I ended up meeting this, these people, and they liked to follow the Grateful Dead. And they invited me to go to a dead show with them in Vegas. And I went there. I'd never been to a dead show. To be honest, I didn't even really like the Grateful Dead that much, you know. But, but I love the parking lot of a dead show. It's, you know, it's like people selling kind beers and Jägermeister shots and tequila shots and, like, falafel, you know, and hippie dresses and hair ties. I mean, it's just, whoa, it was really out there. And no one there knew me. No one was giving me that look. And I started following this band that I didn't even really care that much about, you know, but I was all about the parking lot. And um, during this point in my life, you know, I would I would uh, come to know incomprehensible demoralization like I hope I never have to know again, you know. And I would um, break the hearts of the people that loved me. I learned about, you know, experienced blackouts, passing out, you know, waking up and just having to have a drink. And um, I remember one time I was at a Jerry Garcia band show, and from the parking lot, you know, I could see the Seattle Space Needle. And the next memory I have is waking up with strangers, and I didn't know where I was. And I found out I had had two seizures because I had been, I guess, drinking and taking nitrous oxide or something. But um, I went to the road and went to the close liquor store and found out I was in Eugene, Oregon. I didn't remember anything between Seattle and Eugene. And I remember being afraid, and I called home. It must have been a weekend. And my dad answered, and he said, don't call us anymore. We're not your family. We want nothing to do with you. He hung up on me. My parents had found Al-Anon, you know, and, um, and I'm so grateful they found Al-Anon. You know, I'm so grateful for them and for me. And, you know, I remember getting off that phone call, and I thought, geez, that's harsh. You know, but I had not been a good daughter. The police were showing up at my parents' home looking for me, and my parents were those stand-up people. You know, they paid their taxes on time. They were of service in the community. And my mom, when I got sober, shared about how embarrassing and humiliating that was for them. You know, I had broken in their, into their home and stolen jewelry that my dead grandmother had left my mom and pawned it off at a pawn shop for more booze. And I hate saying that. I hate sharing that with you. Oh, I just, you know, my mom is, is passed away. And every little thing that I have of hers is so precious. But I didn't care. I had to have a drink. That was more important to me than my mom, you know. And, and um, you know, I'd gotten into fights with my sister, and 
I just was not a good daughter. And so I kept on my merry way, kept drinking, and I went to this dead show in Mountain View, California, and one of the things at a dead show is you walk around, you know, with your finger in the air in front of the stadium asking for a miracle, which is a free ticket into a show, and I got a miracle, you know, a free ticket, and, you know, I, I was so wasted that I couldn't even enjoy the show. It should have been, like, the time of my life, you know, and, and, uh, and the next day we're driving home. I was on this, this nice couple from Utah, Bob and Danielle, and their golden retriever, Tobers. They had this West Valley of us, and they were giving me and two other people rides, and we're driving down the California coast, and they're all psyched and jazzed about how great the show was the night before. And that song by Blind Faith came on, you know, Can't Find My Way Home. And I'm looking out that window and crying, and I could not imagine my life getting any worse or any lower. And that was probably in August of 93. And from August of 93 to April of 1994, when I got sober, I would try to stop drinking and fail. Try to stop drinking and fail. I'd wake up each day, and i think, okay, today I'm not going to have a drink. Today, I'm going to put in some applications, and I'm going to get a job. Today, I'm going to move out of this crack house that I'm staying in. I ha have never even done crack, but that's where I was. And I think I'm going to find a room to rent. Today, I'm going to get my GED or figure out how to do that. And I'd be drunk, you know, by 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then each day, I'd get up again, you know. And the guilt and shame of, and the remorse from the day before, the only thing that took that away was booze, you know. And, um, and I, just, I just could not stop drinking. And I met this guy, and his brother was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and his name was Tony. And every time Tony saw me, he smiled and shared about the good life that AA and God had given him. And, you know, he had a full-time job. He went to meetings. He had a sponsor. He had a wife, and they had a baby on the way, and he was a great example of AA. And at that point, you know, I had been exposed to AA um, I had been in two psychiatric wards, a detox center, and a 28-day program rehab. And, you know, I, I couldn't tell you what AA was, though, at that point, even though I had been exposed to it. And so I kept on drinking, and I woke up, you know, on April 17th of 94. One more time, I'm not going to drink today. You know, I find myself drunk, and I'm in this abandoned crack house kind of place without electricity. I fell down some stairs, and I just, I was injured, so I had to lay at the bottom of those stairs all night long. And I don't remember what I thought, but I know I had what we call a moment of clarity. I know that I, I knew that there was something wrong, and it was because of my drinking, and I needed to get some help. And the next day I woke up, it was April 18th of 1994, and I went into the restroom, I looked in the mirror, and I could not believe what was staring back at me. You know, I'd come to find out I was 84 pounds, I had dreadlocks, I was filthy, dirty, I had major anxiety, so I chewed the inside of my cheek, so I had this big swollen cheek, and I was just a mess on the outside. And on the inside, I was so hopeless, I was anxious, I was nervous, I was afraid, I was all of those things that I had been that alcohol had originally taken away. You know, and I, um, I just couldn't believe that was me. And I went to the liquor store and called Home Collect and asked if my parents would help me, and they said no. And um, then I thought of that guy, Tony, and he said there were some indigent free detoxes I could try and call. So I called this place in Santa Ana, and they didn't have a bed for me, but they gave me the number of somewhere else. And um, I called, and this man answered, and he said, we have one bed available, but someone else already called who's interested. So whichever one of you gets here first gets the bed. And so I took the bus down there, and I got the bed. You know, and, and what's funny is um, I have a privilege of serving on the GSR board in our area, and I got into a conversation with our DCMC, and uh, he was saying that he used to volunteer at that, that detox. And I said, oh, my gosh, you know, I got the bed that day. He said, oh, we used to tell everybody that, you know, just to get him down here. But, um, but I got the bed, so I was excited. And um, I remember showing up on that doorstep. You know, I had a trash bag full of clothes and a backpack on my back, and this big man in Wrangler jeans and a flannel shirt answered the door, and he had this deep voice, like I remember, like the Marlboro Man. And he looked at me, and he asked if he could give me a hug, and he gave me a hug, and he said, we're going to introduce you to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, an Alcoholics Anonymous works. Oh, I have chills when I say that, you know? And I had no idea. I had no idea how lucky I was that day, you know? And, um, oh, wow, um, but I went through their 10-day detox, and I don't remember a lot about it. I, I actually, I was thinking about this the other night. I remember that first night being able to shower and getting into the sheets. I remember what the bedroom looked like and just feeling like, oh, clean sheets. 
you know, and, and, um, this H&I panel come, came in, and this woman on that panel came back a few nights later, and she remembered my name, and she smiled when she saw me and hugged me and said she was happy to see me. And no one had been happy to see me for a few years. People were telling me, get out of here. You know, I remember probably six weeks before I got sober, I showed up on my parents in their front yard. You know, while I had been away, they had put up this, they built this courtyard with a wrought iron gate that they could lock to keep me out. And I was sitting in their front yard, and my dad, you know, backed out of the driveway. And he looked at me, and he said, Tara, get out of here. Get your SHIT and get out of here. If your mom sees you like this, it's going to just destroy her. And um, even my family was like, get out of here, you know. And, and my dad talked about that with me when I got sober. And he said, it was hard for me to do that. He said, but I had to protect the person that I love most, and that was your mom. And I'm so grateful that they were strong enough to do that, you know. And but anyways, I, I went through this detox, and after 10 days, I could not go into their 28-day program. They didn't have a bed available. So they gave me the book Alcoholics Anonymous and a meeting directory, and they gave me some food and packed me some lunch and um, gave me some clothes that some people donated and said I should go to AA. And I got on the bus and started going back to that abandoned crack house I had been staying in, and I just knew that if I went back there, I wasn't going to stay sober. But I didn't have anywhere else to go, and... I remember getting off at the bus um, in Irvine to wait to transfer onto another bus. And looking out at that, this man-made lake over in Irvine off of Barranca Parkway, and I remember asking a God, just, I don't know what I said, but I know I connected with a higher power that day. And um, I remember that someone said they went to meetings at a Garden Grove Alano Club. So I went to the payphone, and I called there, and they said, come on down, we have meetings all day. And I took the bus down there, and I stayed sober. And I met this couple, and they let me stay at their home for a few days because I had nowhere to go. And I'm so grateful for the kindness from the people of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've received the entire time I've been sober. And after that, I went into the sober living place for women under the age of 25. And it was there where they said, if you're alcoholic, you need to go to AA. If you're an addict, you go to NA. And they said we had to go to however many meetings a week, and we had to have commitments and have a sponsor and get a job. And I started going to these meetings at this Costa Mesa Alano Club, and, um, and it was kind of a rough crowd, you know, but they were alcoholic. You know, the first, my first home group, they used to call it the Bikes and Dykes meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it was like these rough biker ladies, but they were sharing about alcoholism, and I could identify, you know, and, and I, uh, I'm, I'm a person who, when I got sober, the obsession to drink was not removed from me at all. It was like, it was on, you know, it was like drinking was what I did to get up and get going in the morning. It was what I did to drink away the guilt and shame and the remorse from the day before. It was just what I did. And, you know, it took me coming in here for a while and working our 12 steps, you know, taking those steps before I started to feel comfortable and that obsession was removed. But I would go to those meetings and I'd sit by the back door and I just barely hang it on, you know, and, and then we would do the Lord's prayer and I would drop the people's hands and run out and I heard this woman share one morning that because she had worked the 12 steps and because she had a higher power in her life, the obsession to drink had been removed from her. And I heard that and I wanted that. And I asked that woman to sponsor me. I had no idea I was asking a woman who was active in AA, but I sure am glad that's who I asked that day. And, you know, she, she got me a directory. and She started circling all these meetings. I, she said, you're going to go to this meeting, this meeting, and we're going to get you commitments, and you're going to call me at 6 a.m. And she kept going on and on about all these things I was going to do. And I got hung up on that 6 a.m. thing, you know, I thought. And so she was quiet for a minute. I said, okay. I said, I just I want you to know I'm not a morning person, so that 6 a.m. thing is going to be hard to make. And this nice lady got mean. She was like, you'll call me at 6 a.m. or find someone else. And she walked away. I thought, oh, my goodness. And so I called her at 6 a.m. And I called her at 6 a.m. the entire time she was my sponsor. And that woman saved my life. She saved my life. I mean, I, um, she taught me how to make coffee, you know, in the meetings. Um, she would meet me twice a week before two of our meetings. And we'd sit in her car. And I just, this takes, it's just takes my breath away, but um, we'd sit in the car, and we'd read the book and the 12 and 12 together, and, you know, one of us would read a page, and then the other one, and we'd read it word by word, line by line, and after the end of one page, then she'd say, what stood out to you, and then she'd share about what stood out to her, and she made that book come alive to me, you know, and and um, she made me become like a greeter at the Hope Hospital speaker meeting, which was this great big meeting in Newport on Saturday nights, and 
um, I had to wear clothes that older women donated, you know, to wear, and, and pantyhose, and, um, and uh, high heels, and she'd say, stand at the door and shake people's hands and smile and ask them how they are. I thought, I don't care how they are. You know, I do not care. But I cared about her, and so I just did what she told me to do. You know, and I'd stand there, and then she'd say to me, you know, after the meeting, do you remember anyone's name that you met tonight? And I'd say, yeah. She'd say, okay, why don't you go home and, and start a journal and write down some characteristics of that person with their name. So then next week you can say, hi, John, you know, it's, it's nice to see you again. Or and then she'd say, you know, did anyone share anything with you tonight that they're having a tough time with? And I'd say, yeah, you know, a couple people. And she'd say, okay, great, why don't you call them on Monday and see how they're doing? And she taught me how to start caring about you, because all I cared about was myself. I was so selfish and so self-obsessed. And I can say today, truly, that I genuinely care about you. And I believe it by taking those actions early on. You know, and, um, and she had me call her, and you know, every morning she'd say, have you gotten on your knees and thank your God for another day of life and another day of sobriety? And I'd say, no. She'd say, well, why don't you do that and call me back? You know, and then after a few months of her telling me to do that, I did it one morning before I called, and then she just gave me some other direction. You know, and I took the steps with her. And um, I remember one Saturday morning at my home group meeting, I'd just gotten fired from my first job, and um, she overheard me telling some friends that I would go to a blues concert with them, and she said, well, how are you going to afford to do that? You just got fired from your job. And I said, oh, my dad will pay for it. He wants me to have fun sober. And she didn't like that. She was like, oh, no, no, your dad is not going to pay for that. The only reason why he'd pay for that is he's afraid to death you'll drink and die. You know, and I got mad at her. But I didn't want to, I didn't tell her that, you know. And I thought, come on, this is my dad. And the next day I got really honest with her about who I was and how I was living and acting. You know, I had been sober a short period of time, and my dad had given me just a little, little intro into his life. And I, you know, I'd call him up. I'd say, Dad, I need 20 bucks. You know, and he'd say, well, I, my dad was working two, sometimes three jobs at that time because he was an engineer and the aerospace industry had kind of collapsed around that time. And he'd say, well, I can meet you on my way from my Long Beach job to my Brea job at this time. And I'd say, I can't meet you at that time. I can meet you at 10 o'clock at night. Even though I didn't have a job, I was still such a taker. You know, I'd ride my bike over and get that 20 bucks and mumble some kind of insincere thank you and ride off. And I got honest with my sponsor that that's what I was doing. And she said, Tara, we're not going to live like that anymore. That's not how we live in AA. You're going to stop taking money from him. You're going to start figuring out what you can do to be a good daughter. And she taught me how to be a good daughter. You know, and I told you I got fired from that first job for stealing office supplies because I'm a taker. You know, I'm sober, new at that time, but I was had all those defects of character. You know, and they were fully in action, waving their flags. And... Um, and I, you know, was not a good employee. I would get into arguments with people and storm around the office. I stole office supplies and got fired for that. And, of course, I told everyone there I was sober in AA. You know, I had no idea about anonymity, and I'm horrified that I did that, you know, um, because that was the example these people saw. But she taught me, you know, that we use office supplies in the office. We don't take them home. You don't buy them. And that's really basic. You know, of course I should know that, but I'm a taker. And, um... But I took the steps with her, and, you know, we got to those that immense step, and she asked me, you know, I went through my list with her, and she asked me which one was going to be the hardest, and I said, my parents, and she said, okay, great, you'll do them first. I thought, oh, my God, this lady won't like, give me a break, you know, and, and I was taught, you know, I, I scheduled a time to meet with my parents, and they were willing to meet with me, and I sat across from them, and I made a direct and specific amends, and I asked if I'd left anything out and what I could do to make it right. And my mom was in an Al-Anon, and this is funny to say, but it's so true. She had a list ready of things for me to do to make it right, you know. And, and it was in her beautiful penmanship, and she gave it to me, and, and my life changed that day. I got in my little car, and I drove down the road, and I pulled over, and I started to cry. And I wasn't crying because of the things they were asking me to do, even though I thought some of them were a little extreme and unnecessary. But I was crying because they gave me the opportunity to make it right. And I did everything on that list that they asked me to do, you know, and it took some time, especially the financial amends. But when I was finished with those, with doing everything on the list, my sponsor said I should call my parents and thank them for the opportunity and let them know that I'd finished everything. And so I did that. And my mom and dad, they were really nice about it. And my dad, who was a man of very, 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 very few words, um, he called me that, that night and he said, you know what, babe, we're going to have a little family barbecue this weekend. We'd love for you to join us. And by doing those things, you allowed me an opportunity to become a daughter again. You gave me an opportunity to become a part of their lives. You know, they had not let me 
celebrate holidays with them. They didn't trust me. And, uh, and by taking those actions, things started to change. And I started to show up when I said I would, when they asked me to. For holidays, I'd show up on time and bring what I said I was going to bring and, you know, help clean up the dishes, help my mom after, because you taught me how to do that. If I can come in here and serve you, then I better be able to serve my family. You know what I mean? We practice the principles in all of our affairs. And, um, and I learned that. And I ended up marrying the guy that suggested that I get sober. And we didn't stay married for very long. I don't even know how long. But, um, you know, I, uh, he, you know, he started drinking. Thank you. And, you know, I, in all honesty, I, didn't, I wasn't a good wife. I didn't read our chapter two wives in the book Alcoholics Anonymous about how to be a good wife to somebody who was struggling. And I left that marriage, and I wanted to blame him, put it all on him. But I know that within, like, I don't know, 72 hours, I was sitting across from him making amends for my part. But I left that marriage, and I moved to Laguna Beach, and my first sponsor drank, and just, it was not an easy time in my life. But I found that when things are good and things are bad, more Alcoholics Anonymous always works. And I just threw myself into this program. And I started going to meetings every day, taking H&I panels. If you asked me to do something and the date and time were free in my calendar, I said yes. And I just committed, my, recommitted myself to AA. And, um, and one night, you know, I was at my Wednesday night meeting, and I had my meeting face on. Everything's great. Yeah, how are you? You know, and I went home that night, and I just knew I had to drink. You know, and I didn't want to call a sponsor, and I didn't want to call my friends. But I'm so grateful that I think I had six years at that time, that I had had six years of developing a relationship with a power greater than me. Because I got on my knees in my little apartment, I asked God to please help me stay sober. And I stayed sober. And, you know, I became obsessed with finding a new husband. I'd go on dates with these sober guys, and I'd think, he's the one. And they'd be like, I'm not the one. I'm like, yes, you are. You know, and they're like, no, I'm not. I'm really not. Um, and one day, you know, after a few months of that obsession, uh, I was in my cubicle at work, and it occurred to me that if all I ever got to be was Tara Palomino, a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, then that was enough for me. And that obsession left. And, uh, and I was at the powwow later that year, and I met my husband, Chris, and he's a sober member of AA. He's a good AA member. We love AA. We put it first in our family. We know that if we don't put it first, that we don't have a shot. We're both alcoholic, you know. And, and we've created, you know, a beautiful life. We have two kids, a 16-year-old son and an 18-year-old daughter who have never seen us drink. They've seen me act emotionally immature, you know, sometimes. I'm human. I want to be really honest about who I am here. You know, I'm not perfect by any means. But AA has given me the tools to make that right, to get up each day and try to act better and to put my best foot forward. And, um, and being a mom is such a great gift. And, you know, I came to AA, a high school dropout, and I never aspired to be a high school dropout. I always wanted to go to college, as far back as I can remember. And, um, you know, I started taking college classes. I ended up, it took me 17 years to get a four-year degree, you know, but I did it. I'm slow, but I did it. And then I, you know, wanted to complicate my life a little more and went and got more school. And, and today I have this amazing profession. I work in physical rehabilitation with um, elderly. Actually, it's like memory care. So people with dementia, Alzheimer's, traumatic brain injuries. And, um, and I get to bring AA and God with me every day. It's such a gift, you know, to be able to serve in that capacity. And, you know, I was just a loser, high school dropout, alcoholic girl. You know, my life is so big and so wonderful. And, um, you know, I life on life's terms happens, you know, good and bad. I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, I was at my Monday night home group meeting. I was the birthday girl. I had on a new dress. I'd had dinner with my husband. I got off down from the podium after announcing birthdays, and my husband said, my mom was in an accident, we have to go. And I called my dad on the way from the, the meeting place to our car, and my dad said my mom had been hit by a car when she was crossing the street, and she wasn't going to make it. My life changed that day. It changed a lot. I remember getting in the car, we were driving out to Temecula where they were living, and I called my sponsor, I called my three best girlfriends in AA, and I said, this is what's going on, I don't know what I'm going to need, but I think I might need a little help here. And, you know, AA showed up for me. You know, the day after we came home from, you know, I got to be there and hold my mom's hand when she, they took her off the life support machine. I'm so grateful. My mom and dad loved AA. They loved it. They didn't worry about me anymore. You know, they knew that I was in good hands with you. And we can't, you know, the next day I came home and there was this spiral-bound notebook by our telephone. And my in-laws were there watching our kids. 
and there were probably three to four pages full of names and numbers of messages from people in AA who called, you know, to offer their condolences, to ask if we needed help with our kids, to ask if we needed food. And I learned in that experience that we can stay sober no matter what. You know, we just have to keep coming. We keep coming. We've got to be really honest about what's going on in our life, the good, the bad, the ugly. If we can't do it here, where can we do it? You know, and, and, um, and then, you know, life just kept on going. A few years ago, you know, my dad um, had stage 4 bone cancer, and, you know, and you taught me how to show up. You taught me how to show up that whether I want to, whether I felt like it or not, it doesn't matter. It's just about taking the action. And I got to take him to chemotherapy and be his cheerleader. He didn't need to see his daughter feeling sorry for herself that she was losing her dad. I just got to show up with a smile on my face, take him to chemo. After chemo, we'd go to 7-Eleven, you know, and he'd get a bunch of junk food. And I got to treat my dad, you know, and he'd say, I got it, babe. I'd say, Dad, let me just treat you this time, you know, and... And, uh, and my dad passed away, and, you know, again, he loved AA. He wasn't worried about me when he died. He knew I was going to be okay, and that's because of you. And, you know, if you're newer or fairly new, I probably said something like, um, I hope you find what I found here. And, you know, before I say that really quick, you know, what it's like for me today is that I still continue to put AA first in my life. I don't just say that. I really do. Thank you. Um, I get up in the morning, and I seek to have a connection with a power greater than me, I do our daily readings. I'm so blessed that I get to sponsor women in AA. And we have call times, and they call me, you know, and we talk about AA and the day ahead. And, you know, I go to four meetings a week, and I have commitments at those meetings. I, um, if I, somebody's calling me, and I look at the caller ID, and I don't want to talk to them, I just answer it anyways, you know. And, and I just, I keep showing up, you know, one day at a time. And I love it. And, you know, what I found here is, um, I used to think it was like, you know, getting married, having kids, getting a degree, whatever that is. But, and that's all great, but that's not what I found here. What I found here is I found a relationship with a power greater than me that I choose to call God that is always there for me. I'm never alone. You know, I have a relationship with my sponsor, Tina, who's been my sponsor for over 20 years, and I admire her. I respect her. I don't confuse my relationship with her. She's not my buddy. She's my sponsor. And when I call her and ask for advice, I just follow her direction, and it works out really well. You know, I found um, here a host of friends who are more like family, people I could call at 3 a.m. on a Tuesday morning, and they would show up for me, and I would show up for them. And I found the ability here to stay calm even when I'm in the eye of the storm, because the storm does come. And I think about that, you know, that calm, um, and I think it's because of sitting in rooms like this and meetings like this, you know, day after day, week after week, and hearing your stories, hearing about how you get through things, like when you're father died, or when you had cancer, how did you get through it? And I see you walk through it and get to the other side, and you've already laid the groundwork for me of how I get to get through it, too. You know, and I've also found here um, an ability to be useful. You know, when I got here, I was useless, you know, but you started giving me commitments, and I started to show up on time for those and learn how to be one among many. And there's so many ways that you can be useful here. It doesn't just have to be sponsorship. You know, we can show up and stand at the door and greet somebody. We can call somebody when we know they're having a tough time, you know, a few days later and make sure they're okay. And, um, and it's, you know, it's a great deal. And, and the last thing I'll say, because I'm running out of time, but when our kids were little, I used to take them to the local Barnes & Noble store, and they had a puppet time story hour. And, I, you know, they loved it. And, and then I put them in the double stroller, and, and we'd walk around the bookstore, because I like to read, and there's this section, the New York Times bestseller, like, bookcase shelf or whatever, and there was this book on the shelf for a long time, and it was titled A Purpose Driven Life, and I've heard it's really good. I've never read it, but I, would, I heard it, and, um, and I would walk by, and on the cover it said however many million copies had been sold, and inside I'd walk by that book each week, and I, my heart would smile, because it, it occurred to me that there were millions and millions of people for looking for a purpose, well, we come here, we do a few simple things, we stay sober one day at a time, and our purpose is to stay sober and to carry the message and to be of service to other alcoholics, maximum service to God and our fellows. And what a great gift that some people like us get to have that. So I love AA. I'm really grateful to be here. I love it so much. There's not one thing any of you could tell me that would change my mind. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. 
Thank you very much.